Hello and welcome to Totem, short for Tales of the Motherland. This channel's goal is to transport listeners of all ages to Africa through stories designed to activate their imagination. A few things to keep in mind. This is a relaxation exercise and we want your mind to wander effortlessly to the various places described. All characters are fictional, but locations are factual. We will never give away the exact country's name in the story itself, because our objective is to have you find out through some research where each story takes place. But don't worry, we'll give you plenty of clues. Also, a portion of this channel's proceeds go to a charity we trust in the Republic of Congo. The motherland is very vast and full of exciting adventures and we want to share them with you, your families and your friends. So please remember to like the video and make sure to hit the subscribe button to support our channel. Thank you and let's begin. Turia and the Magic Sand Part 1 It was Friday morning in Lusaka, 7 a.m. and the hustles and bustles of the big city had already begun. Even with school out for the summer, the streets were stirring up with commuters and pedestrians alike, many rushing through Cairo Road in an attempt to beat a traffic that was already showing signs of early congestion. Nestled tightly in the back of her bus, Turia couldn't stop staring out the window in admiration. She rarely ever came to downtown Lusaka, and it was a treat every time she did. She had been dreaming of this day for months now, since her mom and dad had revealed to her that she would travel to Lilongwe to visit her aunt and cousins for the summer holiday. Her good grades had paid off and she barely slept the night before, as her excitement grew bigger. Early this morning, she got up before everybody, showered and put on the perfectly ironed outfit her mom had prepared for her to wear blue linen trousers and a lilac shirt. Turia was grateful, but she thought it was a bit silly that her mom ironed her outfit for her. After all, she was almost 14 years old and would be in secondary school when school resumes in January. She could iron her own clothes, she thought. But Mayo insisted to take care of it. She even packed Turia's backpack making sure she had all the necessities she needed for a pleasant trip. Turia could see that her Mayo was a little bit worried to have Turia travel without her. Mayo, the trip is only 10 hours, she told her. I will be okay. Plus, Dijo will be riding too. Her mother chuckled a little bit. I don't know if that makes me feel better at all. Dijo is nuts, she replied. Mayo, she's my fr best friend, Toria replied with a fake look of shock. They both laughed. After a minute, her mother took on a more serious tone. Toria, I have something for you, she said. She then reached inside a pocket of her dress and took out a little sachet made of raffia. She untied the string that tied the sachet, thus revealing its content. Sand? Toria thought. She was a little confused, but did not want to be rude to her mother, so she decided to stay quiet until she received further information. What in the world was this sand for? There was plenty of sand in the courtyard at the average Ndola house. As if her mother guessed her perplexity, she said, This is not ordinary sand, Toria. It comes from the bottom of the Zambezi River and has been guiding lost travelers for thousands of years. If you ever get lost anywhere, just sprinkle a few grains on the ground and it will guide you. Really? Toria thought skeptically. She could not believe her mother was into that type of nonsense. After all, she graduated with a law degree from one of the most respected universities in the country. How will it 
guide me. It's just sun, she said softly. It will, the way I just explained it to you. Sprinkle just a few grains, not much. You don't want to run out. A few grains are enough to show you the way to go, her mother replied. Doria accidentally let out a little laugh, which did, which did not amuse her mother at all. Doria, this is very serious, her mother reprimanded her. Okay, Moya, I'm sorry. I didn't mean any disrespect. I, I just didn't know you were into this type of beliefs, Doria replied apologetically. Her mother's gaze softened as she confessed. It's okay, my child. It's not entirely your fault. I have not really been good at teaching you the traditions of our ancestors. She then put on a happier face, handed the sachet to Turia, who placed it in her ready trousers pocket. And they both proceeded to finishing the last packing details. It took 20 minutes for Turia's bus to finally reach the outskirts of the city. The suburbs seemed dormant compared to the big city, except for City Market, which seemed to rarely ever sleep. Merchants had already their products ready for the crowds that were already starting to gradually flock the narrow alleys along the myriads of stalls full of clothes, food, household items, and other products. Even Comesa Market, with its endless stalls of chitenges, was already waking up from its brief slumber. The weather was still very chilly outside. Toria could feel a slightly cold breeze before boarding the bus, but she was comfortable now. Plus, sitting right next to Dijo helped keep her warm, which was a relief, since the bus driver never bothered turning the heater on. People on the bus were pretty friendly. Most of them were adults. Riding with Dijo was fun. Her and Toria had been friends since preschool, and although they clearly had different personalities, they always found a way to connect on a deep level. Dijo was like the sister Toria never had. Toria only had brothers, younger brothers, triplets to be exact. And oh, what a pain they could be, getting into her things every chance they got. They were only eight years old, but to use teamwork in such a mischievous way, it was alarming. Their shenanigans always left Toria wondering which one of them was the real culprit, considering they looked exactly the same from every angle. They even got their mother confused once, and she was the only one in her family who could tell those little rascals apart. Dad gave up a long time ago and simply called them Song whenever he called one of them. So Dijo's friendship was crucial to Toria. Their parents knew each other very well too, so there was a lot of familiarity between them. Dijo was a lot more outgoing and rambunctious than Toria, which had earned her a reputation of a wild one. Dijo was such a big part of the family that Toria's aunt agreed very easily to have her go visit as well. Dijo was very grateful for that. She had never been to Lilongwe before and was looking forward to a fun adventure with her best friend and her cousins. The two girls loved each other like real sisters and they shared just about everything. The only thing you can keep all for yourself is those crazy brothers of yours, Dijo often joked. It was no surprise then when Toria told her about the magic sand and how to use it. She even showed it to her. Do you believe it? Dijo asked. Toria shrugged her shoulders. I don't know, she simply replied. I just hope we won't need to test it, she continued. Both girls sat quietly, staring out the window at the amazing scenery. Rolling hills of green pastures, fields after fields of bougainvillea sprawled endlessly along the road, providing a showcase of colors 
that left Turi and Dijo mesmerized. The blooming Mopani and Jacaranda trees offered spectacle just as stunning, with their flowers glimmering in a morning sunshine. This was a sight worth the wait Turiya had endured for the past three months since she learned that she was going on a road trip. As evening rolled in, their bus finally came to a stop at a rest station, making way for Turiya and Dijo to have a much needed bathroom break. Everyone be back in 30 minutes, the bus driver announced, as the bus doors opened and released a cohort of exhausted passengers. Tori and Dijo made sure to be as fast as possible. In fact, they were in and out of the bathroom in just five minutes. With a few minutes to spare, the girls decided to tour the small gift shop section of the station. The store had a reasonable inventory of souvenirs and gifts ranging from little bead bracelets to postcards depicting the country's marvelous sceneries, masks, and a few particularly colorful rocks. The more valuable items were locked in a glass container and included silver and gold jewelry, as well as natural emerald stones, emerald being the gem the country was most popular for. Next to the box were scattered a few rough stones. Dijo picked up one of the rocks. There was a translucent blue hue to it, with strikes of darker blue lines encrusted inside. Every rock had a price sticker attached to it, and the price varied by size and beauty. The one Dijo was holding cost 45 quaches, which sounded insane to Dijo. I bet they found these rocks down the road, washed them, and decided to fool some unsuspecting tourists. She whispered to Turia, and they both chuckled. Actually, you're right, said a male voice behind them, startling them. They didn't notice a tall and thin man who had been quietly observing their take on the rocks. He seemed amused by their surprise and continued with a smile. I actually saw these same exact rocks on my way here, down the road adjacent to the station. For real? Dijo asked, with an obvious look of excitement in, on her face. She wanted one of those rocks so badly, but did not want to spend a quarter on, of her budget on it. She only had 400 kwachas, fun money, for her entire trip, her mother had told her. She had to make it last for a month. She really, really, really liked that rock. She could figure out a way to polish it itself later on and make some amazing jewelry with it. <laughs> yes, for real. Right down the road around the corner on the left, if you go down about five minutes, you will find plenty of those all scattered along the dirt path, the man replied before exiting the store. Victoria gave her an accusing look. No, we are not venturing out in the middle of nowhere to collect rocks, Dijo, she said. It's not exactly the middle of nowhere. There must be houses around and other things, Dijo responded. No, Toria said with a firm voice. Come on, Toria. It will only take us ten minutes. We have plenty of time. Dijo implored. How are you going to even see those rocks? It's almost dark out there, Toria said loudly. She was getting very irritated, probably because she knew Dijo had a way of getting her into doing things anyway. After all, this was the girl who convinced her to eat her own boogers when they were seven years old. Toria could still feel the disgusting taste of the salty, crusty, yet wet nasal discharge. Toria, please! The sooner we go, the sooner we'll be back to hop back on our bus, Dijo pleaded as she followed her friend who was now exiting the store. The sun was quickly setting and all that was left of it was a faint streak that peeked through the Mathinga hills. Plus, Dijo added, We'd find our way back very easily with your magic sand. 
She had a grin on her face that Toria did not like at all. She wasn't sure whether her friend was being serious or sarcastic. Toria thought about it for another minute and finally gave in. Okay, but you better hurry, you crazy girl, she concurred. Yes, Dijo exclaimed as she hugged her friend excitingly. You can hug me on the bus. Let's run. We have exactly 20 minutes, Toria said. And they darted towards the south corner of the station. There were small groups of passengers outside the station near the bus. Some were chatting excitedly. Others were eating snacks, including the bus driver. This latter seemed to be in a deep conversation with a tall and thin man who had approached the two girls inside the store. The man looked at them very briefly, nodded his head, as if to indicate he had noticed them. Then the girls disappeared down the only road adjacent to the station. A, a few hundred yards down the road, and the only two street lights started flickering, then died, sending the two friends into a moment of temporary panic. They giggled a little about it, then continued on. With the moon being up by now, they could still see the dirt path fairly well. It was not long before they came across a heavily wooded area, right where the road came to a fork split. Great, said Toria. Which way do we go now? He never mentioned the road turn into this. She sounded exasperated and ready to walk back to the main road they came from. Dijo sensed her concern and immediately came up with an idea. Hey, she started. Why don't we use some of that magic sand now? Now? What do you mean? We don't know exactly where we're going, Toria said. Yeah, but maybe if we choose a path and sprinkle some of the sand down the path, we will know which way we came from. You know, like those Hansel and Gretel fables you still read, she said with a smirk. Shut up, Tijo, Toria scolded. She understood now why her mom was worried about her traveling with her crazy friend. But she had to admit, sprinkling a little bit of the sand was not such a bad idea. See, the magic sand had a particular color that seemed to glitter when light was reflected upon it. And with the moon now out, it could be used as a reliable reference point. So she decided to follow her friend's advice yet again. She took the sachet out of her pocket carefully and opened it very, very slowly. But before she had a chance to stop her, Tijo grabbed it and emptied it on the ground and was running and laughing as she did so. Turia was mortified. Although she did not fully believe her mother's story, part of her was wondering, what if it were true? She ran after her friend down the right arm of the road. She pursued her for a few hundred yards into the now thicker woods before catching up to her. Once she did, she grabbed the sachet and pushed Tijo. That was very unlikely of her. Tijo fell down but was still laughing. Ish, Turia, you worry too much. That sand is just a prank your mom used to make you behave, Tijo said. What if it's not? Plus, magic or not, we could have used its shining properties to find our way back. But now you spilled it all and we are truly lost, you fool. Toria was screaming at her friend now. You worry too much, Toria. We will find our way back soon enough. We just have to stay on the path we came from, Tijo said, pointing to the way behind her. But to her utter shock, there was no longer a path behind them. In fact, there was no path going forward either. It looked as though they had landed from the sky into a tiny clearing in these woods. How was it possible? 
They probably ran off the path altogether during Dijo's sprint, they figured. <laughs>